So no. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so my name is um, Catherine Bachman. I'm the PGY1 resident here at Yakima Indian Health Services. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about Mount Jaro or Trizepatide. Oh, there it was. Okay, so some objectives for today. We're going to examine trisepatide, um, review some primary literature that's available, and then determine how this could impact our future practices. So first we want to talk about, you know, why are we even talking about this drug or why, why does it matter? Um, so actually in May of 2022, so very recently, the FDA just had approved Manjaro to improve blood sugar control in our patients who have type 2 diabetes, along with diet and exercise. Um, and so this actually is a direct quote from our Director of Division of Diabetes at the FDA Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. And he said, given the challenges many patients experience in achieving their target blood sugar goals, today's approval of Mount Jaro is an important advance in the treatment of type 2 diabetes. Um, we're going to see why that is. So when looking at Mount, uh, Mount Jaro, it's a dual mechanism. So it's actually the first of its class. Um, so it's similar in that it has a mechanism of action like our GLP-1. So it's a glucagon-like peptide receptor agonist. And it's also a GIP agonist or a glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide receptor agonist. So <clears throat> GLP-1 and GIP are both uh, incretins and are released to have the incretin effect. So the incretin effect is an increase in your release of insulin after a meal um, to help the body help control our postprandial sugars. And so uh, GIP has been proposed to be responsible for about two thirds of this effect and GLP-1s are only contribute about one third of the effect. And so that's important because previously we were really only targeting GLP-1s. So this gives us um, some more things to target. On this slide, I really just gave you kind of a breakdown of the difference between GIP and its mechanism of action and then GLP-1s. Um, so really what we see as the difference in the two, you know, if you'll notice GIP also increases our insulin sensitivity. And then GIP can also cause an increased release in a glucagon as well um, to help us when our blood sugars, again, are lower. Um, so um, these other mechanisms of action for GLP-1 are something we see similar with our ozempic or our victoza uh, or trulicity. So right now, uh, Mount Jaro is only approved to treat type 2 diabetes. However, it is also being studied for weight loss um, because of the profound impact that it had during its initial FDA approval. So it's not yet approved for this indication, but if you do want more information for that, um, the trials that are currently being run for weight loss are called the surmount trials. And then those that studied the type two diabetes treatment are called surpass. Contraindications are very similar to what we see for GLP-1s. So personal or family history of medullary thyroid cancer, and then patients with multiple endocrine neoplasia syndrome type two. For our warnings, again, very similar to GLP-1. So um, if you've had bariatric surgery, they do um, have put a warning in there that it can cause some dehydration because after bariatric surgery, fluid intake can sometimes be hard and the nausea that comes with the GLP-1 along with that of gastric surgery. Um, and it can sometimes cause excessive GLP-1 exposure, which can lead to pancreatitis. Um, delayed gastric emptying, so any of your patients who potentially have uh, gastroparesis, and then not recommend, so it's not recommended in patients who have gastroparesis or severe GI disease, and it's not studied in patients with a history of pancreatitis specifically. We know that it, pancreatitis is a warning and it can happen, but it's not necessarily contraindicated if they have a history of pancreatitis, but something you want to be aware of and be cautious of. Um, our adverse effects are very similar to our GLP ones as well. So um, can cause some AKI, particularly due to dehydration, and that's usually secondary to like the nausea, vomiting, um, or diarrhea that can come with a GLP-1 or come with Mount Jaro. Um, diabetic retinopathy, gallbladder disease, GI symptoms, hypersensitivity reactions, increased heart rate, medullary thyroid carcinoma, and then pancreatitis. 
Most common adverse effects that we saw with Mount Jaro are decreased appetite, um, diarrhea, increased serum amylase, increased serum lipase, and nausea. Dosing is going to be very similar to the same dosing scheme that we see for GLP-1. So we start with an initial dose that's not necessarily therapeutic for our patient, but to help them get used to the dosing and get used to the effects of uh, the medication. So we initiate at 2.5 milligrams per week. Um, so it's a weekly injection, just like your Trulicity or your Ozempic. And you would do that for four weeks and then increase to five milligrams per week. The dose can be titrated by two and a half milligrams per week every four weeks if they need further control, and the max dose would be 15 milligrams per week. Um, just like some other GLP-1s, there's no renal dose adjustment or cutoff for this particular medication yet. Um, and then we do want to allow at least 72 hours between doses if we're changing days of the week. Um, so that's just something to be aware of. These are the current available formulations that they have. Um, so they come in these nicely colored pens, just similar to our other pens. And if you'll notice, um, they're marketed by the same company as Trulicity. So they look very similar to Trulicity. Um, there's no needle for them to screw on or anything. You just pull off that top and it has a, a hidden needle in there. Um, Manjaro can be stored at room temperature for up to 21 days. Um, and again, this is... I just put this on here so you could see it's very similar to True Estate because it is marketed by the same company. So pricing is where there is a little bit of a sore spot, unfortunately, for this drug because it is so new. Um, the prices are similar across the board no matter what strength. So if you start at the 2.5 or if you're at the 15 um, milligram pen, the pricing is very similar across the board from what I can see, but cost at least for us, when I looked, was about six times the cost of Ozempic. So it is more expensive. Um, and I chose to use Ozempic because they did directly compare this particular drug to Ozempic. Um, and so, yeah, cost is about six times what Ozempic costs us. So what evidence is there to support this drug? What clinical studies have been done? So the clinical studies that were used to get FDA approval were called the SURPASS trials. There are five of them. Um, there was quite a bit of information on this drug. They did a lot of comparisons. Um, so I am not going to go through every one in detail to spare you the time, uh, but I did kind of give you a brief summary of them here. So in SURPASS 1, terzepatide was compared to placebo at three different doses to measure mean change in A1C. And you'll see in most of their trials, they're looking at A1C. Um, and investigators found clinically significant decreases in A1C. In SURPASS-2, they compared to semaglutide or Ozempic, um, and it was found to be non-inferior and superior to semaglutide. In SURPASS-3, it, it was compared to insulin diplutec, and again, it was found to be superior and had less risk of hypoglycemia. SURPASS-4 is actually a very interesting trial. If you want more information, I do recommend looking into four. Um, so SURPASS-4, they compared to insulin glargine um, to look at the change in A1C, um, and they specifically used patients who had an increased risk of cardiovascular events in this particular trial. It was found to have a greater reduction in A1C, again, less risk of hypoglycemia. And then they did, after they did a post hoc um, exploratory analysis of the trial and found that it also slowed progression of CKD. So they did do some kidney studies here as well. Um, and then in SURPASS-5, when they used it um, in addition to insulin glargine, so whereas before they had compared to insulin glargine, here they used it in addition um, and looked at change in body weight and A1C, and we had a significantly higher number of patients in that combination group reached their goal A1C. So for SURPASS-1, um, trial design is a 40-week double-blind multi-center randomized control trial, and patients either received trisepatide 5, 10, 15, or placebo. Um, their mean A1C was 7.9%, and the mean BMI was 30, about 32%, and I did, or 32, I'm sorry. And I just want you to be aware of those numbers because sometimes, you know, that mean A1C is either much higher or much lower, just depending on what their inclusion and exclusion criteria were. Um, so in particular for SURPASS-1, whether they compared to placebo, 
They chose patients who were not controlled with diet and exercise alone, and they were naive to injectable therapy. Um, they needed to have stable weight within the last three months, plus or minus 5% of their body weight. And then they also made them have an agreement not to start diet and exercise during the program with an intention to lose weight other than what was required for diabetes treatment. For the exclusion criteria, um, you know, all the normal exclusion criteria you would expect. So no one with type 1 diabetes, no history of pancreatitis, um, no history of prolif proliferative diabetic retinopathy, diabetic maculopathy, or non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy that required acute treatment. No EGFR less than 30, and they could not be using any oral hyper antihyperglycemic within three months prior. So the results are listed here for you, and they also gave a really wonderful graphic display, which I'll show in just a second. But basically, the mean changes in A1C um, were uh, increased as the dose went up, so dose dependent. So uh, at our 15 milligram dose, we saw a negative 2.07% decrease in A1C. Um, as compared to placebo, which was negative or which was a positive 0.04%. Um, 87 to 92% of patients reached an A1C of less than seven while taking terzepatide as compared to 20% with placebo. And then uh, 34 to 52% of our patients reached, <laughs> reached an A1C of less than 5.7% as compared to 1% with placebo. They also amassed, uh, measured their fasting serum glucose and it decreased significantly as well. And then they found a pretty significant weight loss. So um, anywhere from seven to nine and a half kilograms with terzepatide. So here's their wonderful graphic um, display. You'll notice they trialed the three different doses of terzepatide and then placebo, and they color coded it here. Um, but so you can see um, obviously the very significant decrease in A1C here of 2.07 with that 15 milligram dose, but even at the five milligram dose, it was pretty significant decrease in A1C of negative 1.87. And then here with the um, target A1C of less than seven, you'll see that even the lowest dose, 87% uh, of their patients on the five milligram dose reached that A1C of less than seven. Um, and so they, they trialed it at multiple A1Cs here as well. Their fasting um, serum glucoses changed from baseline. So they looked at fasting serum glucose to see you know, what was the decrease in their average fasting serum glucose. Um, and again, it's pretty significant results here. So negative 49.3 here with the 15 milligram dose. And then Weight change from baseline. This is really why they started exploring this for weight as well. Um, so they noticed on that, <clears throat> excuse me, on one of the doses, oh, I actually think that's the wrong slide. It goes to later, but um, they did notice up to a 9.5% decrease on terzepatide, um, kilogram decrease on terzepatide. So surpass two. Um, the trial design, again, it was 40 weeks open label, and it was a parallel group randomized control trial. Um, it was multi-center, and patients were, again, assigned once weekly either 5 milligrams, 10 milligrams, 15 milligrams of trisepatide, or they did the 1 milligram dose of Ozempic. Um, the, it had 1,879 patients, and their mean A1C was 8.28%. Surpass so inclusion criteria, very similar to the first set of inclusion criteria, but the thing to note here is that they did, um, they included patients whose type 2 diabetes were not controlled by at least 1,500 milligrams of metformin daily. And the exclusion criteria I didn't include here because they're essentially the same as what they were for surpass 1. And again, um, the results, terzepatide was found to be non-inferior and superior to semaglutide at all doses. Um, and that was compared to the Ozempic one milligram dose. So A1C decrease um, at the 15 milligram dose was found all the way up to be negative 2.3%. And Ozempic, it was a negative 1.86%. Uh, mean changes in weight. Again, we saw some pretty significant mean changes in weight. And then 82 to 86% of our patients achieved an A1C of less than 7%. Um, so not quite as high as the first trial that they did, but still pretty significant results for achieving your A1C goals. Um, so again, here's those graphically displayed. 
Um, so your semaglutide is in gray, and then the blues are your different doses of trisepatide. Um, so again, you'll see a pretty significant change um, in A1C. And then for your patients who met their targets um, with terzepatide, again, it was all the way from 82 to 86% of our patients who met their target of less than 7%. Um, and then patients who met weight loss targets. So here um, they looked again at percentage weight loss. Um, and so like if they lost greater than or equal to 5% of their body weight or greater than up to 15% of their body weight. And then weight change from baseline is listed here again. So um, some of our patients who are on the trisepatide lost all the way up to negative 9.5 kilograms. I posted this as well because I thought it was important. So this is a secondary outcome that they measured and it really just gave the difference um, that they saw in their lipid levels and cholesterol levels. But I did just wanna note that even as a secondary outcome, um, that this, these were pretty still significant um, changes from baseline uh, percentage wise of but both their LDL um, and their triglycerides. If you'll notice like their triglycerides, that highest dose of terzepatide gave them a 24.8% change from baseline. So how do we use it? Since we've got this new wonderful drug, how do we use it? Um, so, you know, right now it's not included in any guidelines because it is such a new um, approval. So it just came out right in May. Um, FDA approved. So no mention in ADA or Codigo guidelines yet. Um, surmount trials are currently being conducted for weight loss. Um, and it's currently approved for type 2 diabetes, but it's not yet approved for weight loss therapy. And so one of the questions people ask frequently, I think, is does it have any cardiovascular benefits? We talk about that with Ozempic and Victoza. Does it have cardiovascular benefits? Um, so that is yet to be seen. Um, so surpass four, they did focus on the comparison of Maljaro to insulin glargine in patients who had increased cardiovascular risk. And the main focus of the trial was reduction in A1C, but they did measure uh, major adverse cardiac or cardiovascular events um, as a secondary outcome. So the data they gathered basically in that scenario was not statistically significant. It was a secondary outcome. Um, they are currently conducting conducting their cardiovascular outcome trials right now, but it does not end until October of 2024. Um, and it can be found at the clinicaltrials.gov. And that is all I have. And if you have any questions, please ask. <laughs> I'll, I'll ask one. It's just one molecule, right? It's not two different molecules bound together. It's one molecule that binds both the GLP-1 receptor and the GIP receptor, or do you know? You know, that is a wonderful question. I actually don't know the answer to that. I'm not sure that it, it might, might be two and it might only be one. I actually don't okay, know. Okay, I've had trouble that. finding that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, very nice, very nice uh, presentation. Any other questions? 